And he joins me right now to talk about the brand new book, Don Rickles, Merchant of Venom. The author joins us right now, Michael Starr. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning, Brad. How you doing? I'm excited to talk about this book. I love Don Rickles, and I've always loved Don Rickles. And I was surprised to find out this was the, or is the first biography written about the career of Mr. Warmth. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, Don passed away in 2017, about five and a half years ago. I mean, uh, obviously, w- while he was alive and working, you know, thousands of magazine articles and people saw him on television all the time. But yes, this is this is the first uh, biography of Don going all the way back to his childhood in Jackson Heights in Queens here in, in New York City. Now, you've written several biographies before, Ringo Starr, to name uh, one of them. Why Why did you want to focus in on Don Rickles? You know, Brad, I've always been, a, I've, like you, always been a big fan of Don's. Um, I, I had the chance, I was lucky enough to interview him several times for my job, my, my day job at the New York Post. I, I cover television. And he was he was such a nice man. I mean, it was it, it was all an act. Uh, that the, the Don Rickles you saw on stage and he, when he was on The Tonight Show and making fun of people, he, he, he was a nice guy off, you know, when, when he wasn't performing. But I just, he had such a, such a, an interesting career to me, uh, you know, a guy who started out, he, he, he served uh, two years in the, in the, in the Navy during World War II. And he really, he didn't want to be, a, he didn't want to be a stand-up comedian at all, of any form. He really wanted to be a dramatic actor. And when he got out of the service, he, uh, he spent two years at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in, in New York City. With several, Grace Kelly was one of his classmates, and Conrad Bain, who went on to different strokes, <laughs> fame, and Maud was one of his classmates, and Don Murray, the actor. It was a very prestigious acting academy, and Don did graduate. He did very well there, but he couldn't get his foot in the door at the time. TV and television in New York City was in its infancy, so most of the actors were focused on Broadway and off Broadway in the theatrical world, as was Don. But he, he, he couldn't make it. I Maybe he just didn't have the chops for it. And he started doing a nightclub act, and not even an insult act at first. It was a very strange amalgamation of <clears throat> impersonation, celebrity impersonations, which is fine. But he had he would do this, this thing he called the man with the glass head, where he would be on stage and put like a glass bowl on his head, and people would try to, he would, he would act out his internal thoughts. It was, it was weird. <laughs> it was kind of dramatic and you know, what a shock. It didn't, it didn't carry over. Nobody, you know, he was having, he was, he was, he he was having some trouble, you know, what could possibly go wrong? But he found himself at a strip club down in Washington, DC, down by the, the, the water there. And he was doing his act and he started getting heckled and he heckled back and he, and he discovered that he had a, the heckle that people who were heckling him loved it. And he loved doing it. And he discovered that he had a, he had a, uh, a propensity for, and, and, and a, um, a talent for this, of making fun of people, of the way they looked or the people they were with or their height or their weight. Any ethnic group, you know, Don covered all the bases. And he started getting more and more bookings. He got a, he got a very, uh, he, he, he went and hired a, um, a manager, a guy named Joe Scandori, who was, uh, owned a club here in Brooklyn. And put Don, you know, Don started working at the club, started getting noticed by a lot of people in show business. And his career started to climb from there. And then he was a big success down in Miami Beach at a club called Murray Franklin's. And that's where he first met. That was really his first big break was uh, for national fame was Murray Franklin's because he met Frank Sinatra there um, unexpectedly. Don's mother, Etta Rickles, was sort of his, she, she was a very forceful personality in his life and he gave always gave her a lot of credit up until the day she passed away of really pushing him to to, to do well and she would travel on the road with him occasionally uh so in around 1959 etta rickles don's mother was in miami beach and she was friends with dolly sinatra frank's mother and 
uh, Frank didn't know Don at that point, but Etta knew Dolly. And Don was at Murray Franklin's in Miami Beach. It was a decent-sized club. It was smaller than most of the bigger clubs there. And he was, Don was doing fine, but he wasn't he wasn't nationally known. Um, he was doing, you know, people in Miami Beach might have known who he was. But uh, Don implored, uh, I'm sorry, Etta asked uh, Dolly Sinatra to get, you know, please, can you, can you get Frank to go see my sonny boy? That's what she always called Don, my sonny boy. So she did. And Don was unaware of this, and he was doing his act in Murray Franklin's one night, and in walks Frank Sinatra, the chairman of the board, the biggest star on the planet at that point. And sort of the crowd got very hushed. Uh, you know, Don, if Frank walked in with some guys you don't want to make trouble with. Sure. And Don, Don looks over without a beat, and he says, go ahead, Frank, make yourself at home. Hit somebody. <laughs> you know, and the crowd, you know, the crowd just goes, gasps. You know, you, you wait a beat, Sinatra laughs, everybody goes, oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, so Frank laughs, so we can all laugh. And and so he laughed, and then Don just started going, you know, I saw your last movie, Frank, the cannon was a better actor than you were, you know, and <laughs> your, your voice, you know, it sounds like it's in the throat of Perry Como, you know, all this kind of stuff. And <clears throat> so once that was, you know, okayed, once he had the seal of approval from Frank Sinatra, it was it was up and up and up from there, and that really opened a lot of doors for him. And they remained lifelong friends. And I, I always loved, um, and you can watch these too on YouTube now, when in the mid-70s when Don was a, sort of a semi-regular on The Tonight Show with the John Oh, Carson. yeah. These, these legendary and, appearances. Yeah. I mean, th these were the days before, quote-unquote, must-see TV, but they were must-see TV. And it was, always, it was always better to me when Sinatra was on because Don would... There's one particular instance where Don just walked. He would do this. He would walk on unannounced. He walks on, and, Sin and Sinatra was there, you know, doing an interview with Johnny. And Don sits down next to him, and, you know, he, he starts in on him. You know, Frank, uh, you know, I, I, I heard about, uh, you know, Mongo Manganansi yeah. in New Jersey. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he, started, he started his car, and, you know, he was he's all over Jersey City now. Boom, you know. And, now he's a parking lot. You know, yeah. Yeah, right. And, you know, right, exactly. You know, because Sinatra always had those, you know, alleged ties to the man. Sinatra loved it. He didn't, he didn't get angry. And Don would just go on and on in that vein. Um, and uh, it was just it was great. He would, he would, he, that was, I think, in that appearance, too, like he kisses Sinatra. He goes, I love you. And he, you know, and Sinatra's like, get away from me, you know. But it was, it was great television. And it wanted, sort of wanted to me the, the, the benchmarks of late night television in the 1970s was always was Don Rickles on the Tonight Show. He did other shows too. Merv Griffin and Joey Bishop had a talk show in the late 60s, and Mike Douglas in the day in daytime and Dinah Shore. He did, Don was all over the place, but it was those appearances on the Tonight Show, which was the biggest show on television at nighttime. You know, 30 million people. So it's yeah, Johnny Carson was a kingmaker. He was. He was the king of late night, and to get a spot on Carson, no matter how long it was, or you know, your career was was going to be made. And uh, uh, yeah, so Don was, always, and Don would host guest host the Tonight Show when Johnny wasn't there. As a matter of fact, you know, you remind me, um, Brad, that one of the classic Tonight Show appearances, which they, they, which Johnny used to show every, you know, we had he had like you know twentieth anniversary, fifteenth anniversary. Uh, there was one night Don's best friend in show business was Bob Newhart. Mm -hmm. um, if people don't know that, you know, it, it, it's it, 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 two guys, polar opposites, you know, Newhart was the laid back. He was a comedian, but he started as an accountant, you know, very soft spoken. You know, he had the whole telephone routine. Don was always in your face, brash, but they were best friends and their wives were best friends. So one night, um, Newhart, Bob Newhart was, was guest hosting the tonight show. Johnny was, you know, on one of his 85 vacation weeks <laughs> that year. <laughs> And Don, yeah, and Don, and Don was the guest. You know, two good friends uh, joking around on the Tonight Show, and Don picked up Johnny's cigarette holder. He was making a point about, I think it was about getting his passport stamped, and he sort of used the cigarette holder as a stamp, and he broke it. You know, and, and Newhart's like, oh no, you know, Johnny's going to be angry about this. So at that time, Don was taping his NBC sitcom, CPO Sharky. Um, right across the hall at NBC in Burbank. It was literally like 20 feet away from the Tonight Show stage. So the next night, Johnny came back, and this was all set up beforehand. Johnny knew that, that the cigarette case had been broken, but they set up this whole gag. So Johnny comes on, he's like, you know, hey, what happened to my cigarette case? He's holding it up, it's all cracked. 
And somebody says, you know, it was Rickles. He was on last night. So Johnny, in mock outrage, he gets up from behind his desk. He has like a, a portable microphone with him, with him. The camera, he gets up, he starts walking across the hall to see Pierre Sharkey. The cameras are following him. He opens up the door to Don's studio where Don is actually taping CPO. He's taping a scene of CPO Sharkey. And he walks in and he goes, Rickles, what did you do? You know, and it was like one of the only times Don wasn't in on the joke. One of the only times Don was speechless. He looks up, he sees Johnny Carson. There. <laughs> he just, he, he breaks up laughing. And then eventually he got it, you know, he got into the groove and started, you know, and, and getting into the routine and, and everything. But it was a great piece of television. And uh, it's you, you can watch that also, you know, if you, if you go onto YouTube or other places, you can, you can see that, um, how great that was. And uh, it just kind of showed the friendship between those two and, and how uh, Don was just a, just such a big part of television in those days and, and literally up until pretty much the end of his career. Just a, a legend in his own right, and and the the triumphant of him, Frank Sinatra, and Johnny Carson was always fun to watch in their interactions on on the Tonight Show, or wherever else. Man, I, I could talk to you so much more about Don Rickles, but the book is called Don Rickles: Merchant of Venom. It's the first official biography of Mr. Warmth himself. Uh, Michael Seth Starr joins us this morning to talk about it. Michael, congratulations on the book, and and just make sure you just don't go out there and drop your pants and fire off a rocket, okay? Yeah, the same, right, the famous John Lott. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to do that. I might end up in the gossip column. But I'll, I'll, I'll keep my pants on now. <laughs> okay. Michael, Thanks, th- thank you so much.